Before studying insulin therapy, let's first briefly recap type 1 diabetes. We know that type 1 diabetes is characterized by hyperglycemia and is actually due to the destruction of majority of the beta cells of the pancreas due to any autoimmune disease, for example secondary to a viral infection. That's why it has an early onset that is about 15 years of age. Type 1 diabetics are also prone to ketoacidosis and I will explain this later in this video. Let's stop talking about type 1 diabetes and start focusing on the normal insulin physiology to help us understand its function and its use. Now we know that the beta cells will secrete insulin. Now when will it secrete this? It will secrete this in response to three main stimuli. First is the chemical stimulus, second is neural and third is hormonal. The chemical stimulus is actually given by the glucose and amino acids levels in the uh, blood after we eat while the neural stimulus is by the parasympathetic nervous system which of course increases insulin release while sympathetic nervous system beta 2 receptors will also increase insulin release while alpha 2 receptors will decrease it. Lastly the hormonal stimulus is glucagon like peptide 1, gastrointestinal inhibitory peptide, gastrin, secretin and cholecystokinin which all of which will increase insulin secretion. Now that insulin has been released from the beta cells of the pancreas, what does it do in the body? We'll look at some of the major metabolic effects of insulin. Firstly, what it will do is increase the glucose uptake and utilization in the peripheral cells to lower the blood levels of glucose. Secondly, it will inhibit glycogenolysis, that is glycogen breakdown in the liver in the uh, muscle tissue etc. It will inhibit gluconeogenesis in the liver as well by inhibiting the rate leg regulating enzyme that is fruc fructose 1,6 bisphosphatase. Thirdly, it will increase protein synthesis. It will increase fat deposition and storage in the adipose tissue. It will augment glycogenesis in the, in the liver and muscle and also increase potassium uptake. By carrying out all of these processes, what insulin is actually trying to do is maintaining the blood glucose level between 110 and 126 mg per deciliter. And all of these actions of insulin that we've just discussed are antagonized by another sets of hormones such as growth hormone, thyroxine, glucagon, corticosteroids and catecholamines. Coming back to diabetes type 1, we know that the only problem in this disease is no insulin, right? So we can actually su supplement insulin either by insulin preparations or by insulin analogs. The insulin, we cannot uh, just administer insulin directly because you know it's a peptide and like all peptides, if we give it orally, it will be digested. So we give it IV or subcutaneously or even intramuscularly. Insulin can be administered via syringes, pen devices, insulin pumps, etc. Now mainly insulin is used in diabetes type 1 but it can also be used in uncontrolled type of uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus and that one which is not controlled by diet or lifestyle changes or even oral hypoglycemic drugs. The purpose of insulin therapy is to maintain the postprandial blood glucose less than 150 mg per deciliter while the fasting blood, uh, blood glucose level should be between 90 to 120 mg per deciliter. Now let's see what sort of pharmacological uh, preparations we have. Now let's see what sort of pharmacologically available insulin is there to treat diabetes type 1. First are the insulin preparations that are either derived from an animal source or from re recombinant DNA technology and that have the same structure and amino acid sequence as human insulin while the second ones are insulin analogs. They are slightly different from the human insulin. The first of the insulin preparations are conventionally derived from animal sources. The second are monocomponent insulin which are actually purified forms of the conventional and third is the human insulin. Conventionally insulin was derived from beef that is bovine insulin or from pig that is porcine insulin 
The beef bovine insulin is different from human insulin by three amino acids and it is also antigenic because it might contain pancreatic proteins or as well as the C-peptide that makes it pro-insulin. The porcine insulin has one amino acid different than the human ins insulin and is less antigenic than the bovine one. Both of these are not used currently. Secondly, the monocomponent insulin is actually a purified form of the porcine insulin. The purified uh, form does not contain the pancreatic proteins and pro-insulin and is less antigenic than the conventional form. And the purified insulin should have less than 10 parts per million uh, pro-insulin contamination. Lastly, the human insulin is derived from recombinant DNA technology by E. coli or yeast. It has the same amino acid sequence as human insulin, thereby it will not cause antigenicity and no immune response. It does not cause lipodystrophy at the site, uh, site of subcutaneous injection and there is no insulin resistance as well. The examples are regular insulin or human NPH insulin. The regular insulin can also be given IV in emergency cases such as diabetic ketoacidosis. Now the insulin analogs are also created by recombinant DNA technology but they have a slightly different amino acid sequence and thus different pharmacokinetic properties. That is actually good because if it is entirely human insulin then it can be proteolized and it will not have a longer action. They will have the same action as insulin and they are divided into rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting and long acting insulins. The rapid acting insulin is Lispro, it can be given IV as well in emergency cases, Aspart and Glulicine. It is given just before meals because it has a very rapid onset of action of just 5 to 15 minutes and peak is reached in 30 minutes. The short acting insulin is uh, the regular soluble insulin that we discussed uh, previously in the human insulin and its onset is about in 30 minutes and peak reaches 2 to 4 hours so it should be given 30 to 45 minutes before meal it can be given IV as well in emergency cases thirdly intermediate acting insulins are neutral protamine hedone insulin or isophane insulin its onset is in about 1 to 2 hours and the peak reaches in 6 to 10 hours it can be given subcutaneously lastly the long-acting insulins are glargine and detimer. They are extensively bound to albumin, so they have a prolonged action. Their onset is in about 24 hours and they have no peak, they are peakless. That's why they maintain a constant background level of insulin and thus have a reduced risk of nocturnal hypoglycemia. They are, however, contraindicated in pregnancy. Two important drug interactions with insulin are important. One is its interaction with the beta blockers. Now you know that if a patient goes into hypoglycemia and there is the sympathetic response of uh, tachycardia, palpitation, etc., then that will be masked by uh, beta blockers and we will not know if the patient has gone into hypoglycemia and that is very dangerous. Secondly, salicylates will augment the hypoglycemic effect by increasing beta cell sensitivity to glucose and also increasing insulin secretion. Now there are certain complications of using insulin as diabetes type 1 therapy. First and the most common and the most dangerous complication is hypoglycemia. And we know that the brain needs glucose for its survival and working. So even if the glucose supply is cut for 2 to 3 minutes, it can result in extensive brain damage. This will occur if the diabetic is doing some exercise or has an increased dose of insulin or has delayed eating for some, re from, for some reason. Now the symptoms of hypoglycemia can be autonomic that is the sympathetic activation that wants to counteract the hypoglycemia and will result in tremor, palpitation, sweating, anxiety and tachycardia and neuroglycopenic symptoms such as headache, blood vision, confusion, loss of fine motor skills, abnormal behavior and convulsions leading to unconsciousness. Now all of this can be treated simply by giving glucose. If the patient is conscious we need to give oral glucose if uh, the patient is not conscious we can give 50 percent dextrose iv and also if the hypoglycemia is very severe we can give glucagon or adrenaline 
Now remember, if the patient is a chronic alcoholic, you need to give thiamine with glucose because if you do not do that, you will result in Wernicke's Korsakoff syndrome. Allergic reactions with insulin are rare but can occur as a local redness and inflammation. It is due to the minor contaminants in insulin. Third is lipodystrophy, that means either atrophy or hypertrophy at the site of injection and this can be uh, limited by using purified insulin or changing the site of injection. Prolonged insulin therapy can also result in insulin resistance and in this case more dose is required to cause the same action and acutely it can be caused by uh, any sort of stressful condition such as infection or uh, trauma etc. It can also lead to edema due to salt and water retention. Lastly, let's see two important complications of diabetes type 1. First is diabetes ketoacidosis, which is actually a medical emergency characterized by polyuria, polydipsia, nausea, fatigue, dehydration, cool small breathing. Now this breathing is characteristic of diabetic ketoacidosis. It is a very rapid deep breathing without dyspnea when lungs are trying to get rid of the acidosis thinking that it might be caused by carbon dioxide. Another symptom is fruity breath due to the acetone that is formed. It is also a ketone. Now why this all occurs is because type 1 patients do not have insulin, right? So insulin is required for glucose to go into the cells and be utilized by them. So the cells are um, in a state of hunger because they cannot utilize it. So the liver starts producing ketone bodies which are acetone, acetoacetate and beta hydroxybutyrate. Among these three, acetone is volatile and is responsible for the fruity breath of diabetic ketoacidosis patients. Now as I said, diabetic ketoacidosis is a medical emergency, so the management will include IV regular insulin, there should be rapid fluid re replacement with uh, giving normal saline etc. And after insulin is given, then all of the potassium will be uh, will have gone inside the cells and there will be hypokalemia. So we need to correct that as well by giving potassium. And if required, we can also give sodium uh, bicarbonate. And if needed, phosphates and antibiotics should also be given because as I said, diabetic ketoacidosis is precipitated by stressful conditions such as infection. The second and last uh, thing we need to discuss is hyperosmolar non-ketotic diabetic coma. This is actually characterized by severe hyperglycemia and hyperosmolarity le leading to dehydration and all sort of symptoms. Now the chief therapy in this case is to replace the fluid as soon as possible and give IV insulin and potassium just like in diabetic ketoacidosis. Now in spite of uh, intensive therapy there is a high mortality rate unfortunately of about 50% in this case. That's all about insulin therapy and type 1 diabetes.